in the High Court of New Zealand. Auckland Registry. CRI 2006-404-000260. Rochelle Rees, Appellant. V. New Zealand Police, Respondent. Hearing, November 16, 2006. Appearances, Appellant in Person. K. Hogan for Respondent. Judgment, December 20, 2006 at 10.30 a.m. Judgment of Asher, J. This judgment was delivered by me on December 20, 2006 at 10.30 a.m. pursuant to Rule 540, 4, of the High Court Rules. Registrar slash Deputy Registrar. Solicitors, R. Rees, Hillsborough, Auckland, Meredith Connell, Auckland, 1. On May 30, 2006 Rochelle Rees was convicted and discharged of the offense of having been in a public place, behaving in a disorderly manner. She appeals against her conviction to this court. 2. The facts are straightforward. The police had received complaints about noise arising from an animal rights protest outside the Langham Hotel on Simons Street, Auckland. They went to the entrance of the hotel and observed Ms. Rees using a loud hailer. A constable approached her and informed her that the police had received complaints regarding the noise. He warned her to cease making loud noises, otherwise she would be arrested for disorderly behavior and breaching the peace. After a short space of time he observed Ms. Rees turn the loud hailer on again and yell slogans through it. He then arrested her at which stage Ms. Rees yelled more slogans and blew a whistle. Three in these circumstances, the learned district court judge determined that the prosecution had met the burden and standard of proof. He stated, I am of the view that she has committed the offence for which she has been charged and Section 6 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990 in the circumstances of this case does not afford her a defence. As I said, lawful protest is a protest that does not give offence or annoyance or cause injury or harm or a criminal act to any other person or portion of society. On that basis, therefore, I find the information proven after hearing. Disorderly behavior. For the offense of disorderly behavior is created by Section 4 of the Summary Offenses Act 1981. The Court of Appeal determined the parameters of the offense, in the context of protest action against the Vietnam War, in Melser v. Police 1967 and ZLR 437. Turner J. stated at page 444. Disorderly conduct is conduct which is disorderly, it is conduct which, while sufficiently ill-mannered, or in bad taste, to meet with the disapproval of well-conducted and reasonable men and women, is also something more it must, in my opinion, tend to annoy or insult such persons as are faced with it and sufficiently deeply or seriously to warrant the interference of the criminal law. 5. It is not necessary for disorderly behavior to go so far as to constitute a likely or imminent breach of the peace. However, conduct which is disapproved by the majority of right-thinking persons is not in itself enough. Conduct which is merely irritating and out of the range of the conduct of ordinary right-thinking New Zealanders, does not necessarily constitute disorderly behavior or warrant the intervention of the criminal law. As was stated by Wild J. in Wainwright and Butler v. Police 1968 and ZLR 101 at page 103. The conduct in question is in every case a matter of degree depending upon the relevant time, place, and circumstances. Conduct that is acceptable at a football match or boxing match may well be disorderly at a musical or dramatic performance. Behavior that is permissible at a political meeting may deeply offend at a religious gathering. The principles set out in Melser v. Police and Wainwright and Butler v. Police have been applied since by New Zealand courts. 6. The fact that conduct causes annoyance to members of the community, and perhaps serious annoyance, is not enough in itself. Freedom to protest is a fundamental right in any democratic society, Melser v. Police, page 445 per McCarthy J. That right to protest can extend to making a loud and even annoying noise. This freedom was reiterated in the recent Court of Appeal decision R.V. Brooker 2004 and Z.A.R. 68, paragraph 28. The Crown emphasizes that this must be balanced by what is said at paragraph 29 of that judgment, 
that the rights of freedom of expression in peaceful assembly do not trump other rights, interests, and obligations. 7. Ms. Rees in her oral submissions relied heavily on the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990. While I accept that Section 4 of the Summary Offences Act 1981, setting out the offence of disorderly behaviour, must be read in the light of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990, the Bill of Rights has not led to any express change to the legal test of disorderly behaviour. The pre-1990 cases fully recognised the right of citizens to protest, and the associated freedoms of expression and assembly that are referred to in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act. While there has been a change in the approach of the courts to issues involving human rights since 1990, in this case, the result was likely to be the same both before and after the Bill of Rights Act. Application of the Test 8. The Learned District Court judge did not set out in his decision any specific factual conclusions as to the nature of the conduct. Rather, he summarized the position in general terms. It is necessary to consider the actual evidence adduced before him. 9. There was one witness called by the police, Constable Swata. The incident occurred at 7.50 p.m. on a Wednesday evening in the inner city. The evidence was that Ms. Rees was outside the hotel, and yelling through a loud hailer, acting as a leader in a chant. She was, according to Constable Swata, making the loudest noise of all the protesters. Her remarks were addressed to those in the hotel. She blew a whistle when she was taken to police custody, and continued to yell slogans. The constable had warned the protesters against making noise, and made the point in cross-examination that the warning was against excessive noise. Ten Ms. Rees in her evidence accepted that she was chanting into a megaphone. She stated that she regularly protested for animal action groups, and there was an issue as to what level of noise was acceptable. She considered that the police requirement that she not chant into the megaphone was unreasonable. 11. The constable's evidence went no further than asserting that the noise was excessive. He did give evidence that the police visit was as a consequence of complaints from neighboring apartments, but no one was called from those apartments. There was no evidence adduced from any members of the public, that they were inconvenienced or in any way affected by the noise. 12. It is difficult to see in these circumstances how it can be said that this conduct constituted disorderly behavior. The learned judge stated, Silent protest cannot give effect to annoyance, and it is my belief that in exercising the right to protest, and Rochelle touched on this herself by reference to the section, one has the duty not to annoy, not to break the law and that is the question. 13. It is not correct to say that in exercising the right to protest, a citizen has the duty not to annoy. It is permissible, within limits, for a citizen to annoy others while protesting. It is not enough that the conduct is irritating or ill-mannered or in bad taste. Protesters often set out to cause irritation, to attract attention to their message. That is not in itself illegitimate, or a breach of the criminal law. There is a line beyond which protesters cannot cross without offending the criminal law, and that line involves annoyance beyond that which is normal and acceptable to New Zealanders. Loud protests through a megaphone are not uncommon in New Zealand streets. It is a method of protest that is often used. It is not a breach of our criminal law in itself to use such a method of protest. It is not a breach of our criminal law to annoy others while doing so. 14. I would also observe that I cannot agree with the judge's approval of silent protest. A silent protest can give effect to very serious annoyance, and could in certain circumstances be disorderly behavior. 15. I do not regard Ms. Rees' ongoing noise once arrested as changing the position. If she was entitled to make a noise in the street, she was also entitled to continue once arrested and placed in the police truck, providing this did not amount to resisting arrest or some other offense. The noise did not become more disorderly just because she was arrested. As it turns out, she should not have been arrested. 16. There being no evidence from the police that serious annoyance had been caused to any member of the community from the actions of Ms. Rees. The threshold beyond which the criminal law intervenes was not crossed. This was not disorderly behavior. Conclusion 
17 The district court judge made an error of law in assuming a duty not to annoy when protesting. There is no such duty. 18 There was no evidence that the behavior of Ms. Rees reached the degree of annoyance where the criminal law will intervene. Ms. Rees should not have been convicted. 19 The appeal is allowed. Costs. 20. Ms. Rees has sought costs. However, she represented herself in this court, and should not have incurred legal costs. Costs are not awarded to compensate a party for personal time and effort. I decline to make an order as to costs. Asher, J.